And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn in them with me to John chapter 4, where we'll be looking this morning at verses 20 through 26 from John chapter 4. In this, my fifth sermon in this little topical series on the subject of the church. It's called, the sermon series is called Ecclesiology 101. And so I'm trying to just give some basics about what does it mean to be a part of the church? What is the church? And and why would you join a church? And what does that, what does it mean? And what are you committing to? And some things like that. Now, last week, some of you, again, it was a smaller crowd, Labor Day weekend. Last Sunday, I took a little detour and I preached on the subject of work. It was Labor Day weekend. And uh, so I preached on the subject of work from Colossians chapter 3. And I will, Lord willing, my plan is to do that every year to preach something about work, not necessarily just Labor Day weekend, but maybe the weekend before, the weekend following, because some of you travel every Labor Day weekend, you have family reunions or whatever. So, um, so but I want to preach on that subject every year because of the importance of work, and it's such a huge part of m- most of our lives for much of our lives. So today we're getting back into the subject of ecclesiology, uh, which again, I mentioned a few, a few times, is really just a $3 word that means the, the church, the study of those who are gathered together, the assembled ones, the, the science of or the doctrine of the church, Ecclesiology 101. And the last sermon in this series was on the fourth vow that you affirm when you join a church, which says, um, do you submit yourselves to the, no, that's the fifth vow. Um, do you promise to support the worship and work of the church to the best of your ability? And so I talked about what does it mean supporting the church and the worship of the church and and the work of the church. This time I want to dive in a little bit deeper on the subject of the worship of the church. Because one of the main things that we do as a church is we worship together. I mean, that's, that's kind of the prime thing that we do. I mean, we do lots of things together, but this is one of the prime things is we gather together for worship. So what all does it mean? And just to give you a little bit of context for this passage from John chapter 4, um, Jesus was in a conversation with, uh, uh, with a woman at a well. This is a Samaritan woman, which was in a sense, the Samaritans were, would sometimes re- be referred to sort of as a mix between the Jews and Gentiles. There were inter- inter- intermarriages there, um, sort of half-breeds in a sense. Sometimes they might be referred to as mongrels or whatever. That's, they were very much looked down upon for that intermarriage by the Jews. And here is Jesus having a private one-on-one conversation, not only with a Samaritan, but with a Samaritan woman. And if you read the whole story, even more that you could be sort of aghast at uh, in that conversation. But so they're having this conversation. She's figured out over the course of this conversation that this guy is kind of special. There's something unique about him. There's something different. He's a holy man. He's a prophet of some sort. There's, there's something he's connected to God in a special sort of way. And so when she realizes that, she starts quizzing him then about spiritual things, about um, church life in a sense, about particularly about worship. And so that's where we'll pick up the story is in John chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 20. I'll read just through verse 26. If you're able, please stand in honor of God's holy word. This is the woman speaking to the Lord Jesus. She says, Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. This is God's Word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, please now open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things from this, your word. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And the children are at this time free to be dismissed for the children's Bible lesson.
as many of you know, I've had this sort of bronchitis, a cough going on for several months now, and um, one of the suggestions was that I try some uh, allergy meds, and I think that has been helpful. Um, of course, you know, I'm going to read the instructions there, and uh, it says to take just one tablet every 24 hours. So in other words, how I take that medicine is significant. It matters. And you're the same way, no doubt. You have some medications that perhaps you're only supposed to t you, you know, take it every six hours or whatever, or you take it every 12 hours, or you take it once a day but at the same time every day, or you take it with, with food or, or whatever. How you take your medications matters. It's significant. It's it's of crucial life and death sometimes importance how you take your medication. Y'all, the same, it's the same way with worship. How we worship matters. Um, it's not insignificant. It is crucial for us as Christians to think about what we do in worship and how we go about worshiping. And so that's my theme for the, ser for the sermon this morning. How we worship matters. It's of crucial importance, really. Now, you can think back to Exodus chapter 32, where the uh, Israelites getting impatient with Moses, his not coming down, him not coming down from the mountain. And so they take their gold and they uh, get it sculpted into this um, golden calf. And, of course, in the process, they're breaking the second commandment in, in doing that. Um, and, of course, it was a life and death situation. It cost the lives of many. Um, worship can be how you worship can be a life and death situation even. Uh, you know, in that particular situation, it's interesting to think it wasn't that they were worshiping a different God. They were still worshiping in their minds the same God, but they were worshiping the right God in the wrong way. So how you worship matters. It's significant. You can think about the same sort of thing in Leviticus chapter 10. You've got uh, these couple of priests uh, Nadab and Abihu, and it says in Leviticus chapter 10 that they offered unauthorized fire. Um, so they, were, uh, they had incense and different sorts of uh, smells and bells. You've heard that term before sometimes talking about worship services and things like that. And, and so they, they had a, a wrong smell. <laughs> they had unauthorized fire. They, they had just sort of worshiped according to their own ideas about how we were going to do this. And again, it was um, uh, life-altering for them. How we worship matters. It's not insignificant. If, if we all were invited to go and have a visit with the Queen of England, we would have all kinds of questions. What's the protocol? What, what do I wear? Where do I stand? How do I address her? What do I say? What do I not say? If, it's, if, it's, if we're going to be that concerned about how we go about visiting with the Queen of England, so much more so should we be concerned about the way that we worship and giving God the rights, the honors that He is due and worshiping in a way that is in accord with how He tells us to worship Him. So that's what we're, we're looking at this morning. And I just want to uh, have, I have two things for us this morning from this passage. This passage teaches us that how, how we worship matters. And it teaches that it matters in two ways. Number one, we must worship in spirit. We must worship in spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, um, one of the key aspects of worship was where you worshiped. The issue of place, which is why this woman is asking the question about where do we worship, on this mountain or that mountain? So the place where you worship was of crucial importance. And in the Old Testament, they worshiped in this movable tent called the tabernacle. And so as they moved around, they would set it up, and it was very elaborate, and there were all kinds of details about how this thing was to be built and, um, uh, and, ha and what sort of animals you brought in and how you would sacrifice the animals and, and who could do the sacrificing and how they would be ordained and the clothes they would. There were all kinds of details, but it all centered around this place, the tabernacle. That was the main issue uh, there in that time. During the time of Jesus, the place still mattered. It was very significant still, but it was in Jerusalem. Uh, the place where, where uh, the Jews gathered there in Jerusalem was at the temple. No longer was it a movable tent, but it was a, a fixed building. And what Jesus says in verse 21 is that a change is taking place in how you worship. 
He says in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. That would be shocking news to a Jew and to a Samaritan. And what he says in verse 24 gives a little clarity. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So there's this shift that takes place. What matters now is not really the place where you worship, but what matters, it still matters how you worship. But it's, the issue is not the place, but the spirit. Not the location, but how you worship, whether it is in a right spirit. In other words, it's not worship just because you attend a service in a church building. It's been said that uh, in the New Covenant, the place, of, the place of worship is not geographical, but ecclesial. Now that's, again, you, that ecclesial, you're hearing that, that word with this sermon series, ecclesiology. You might, hear, you might think also of the Old Testament book that we have in our Bible called Ecclesiastes, which is the gathering together, the assembling of wise sayings. And so that's what you've got when you think of ecclesiology as a church, the gathering together of God's people. And so what we see is that in the New Covenant, the place of worship is not geographical, it's ecclesial. It's not a place, but it's a people. That's what's important. The people of God having the Holy Spirit and worshiping in the Spirit. You're familiar, no doubt, with the verse from, uh, that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. That's worship taking place. It, again, it's, it doesn't, doesn't matter the building, the locale. What matters is, are these the people of God? Are they filled with the Holy Spirit, worshiping in spirit and in truth? You know, this is a beautiful sanctuary. Been, people have been worshiping in, in this sanctuary since 1902, 1901. I'm trying to remember when the first sanctuary built, around 1900, 19. Been worshiping here a long time, and it's a beautiful building. But this building is not what makes worship here special. It's the people. That was, the, that was my first sermon uh, on this whole series, is that the people, the people of God are a building, a bride, and a, um, oh, y'all, y'all should remember, I, this is a quiz for us. I can't remember my own sermon. <laughs> building, bride, another B, I can't remember, any, um, um, body, body, that's it. And did somebody say body? Okay, there we go, yes. Yeah, so, um, so, so we're, you're the people of God, you're the building of God. I'm looking at the building. It's not when I take my eyes up off of you and look at stained glass or plaster or whatever. I'm, when I look at you, I'm looking at the building of God. And that's what matters. You know, I've had the privilege of traveling uh, numerous places around the world and worshiping with a lot of people in a lot of different places and um, without air conditioning. You know, flies all, you know, all around you and, you know, all kinds of places that, that you might, you, you would be tempted to say, this is not very worshipful. Listen, that's not the issue, not whether you feel like it was worshipful. The issue is, is the spirit there? Is, are the people of God there giving God the praise and honor that he's due? So we must worship in spirit. Second, worship must be in truth. Worship must be in truth. What Jesus says in verse 22 is interesting. He says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, what we know for salvation is from the Jews. So Jesus is here really taking sides, and he's siding with the Jews. He, he's, he's saying to the, to, to the woman here, essentially, you, you Samaritans worship, and I wonder if he would have even used, you know, the air quotes there on worship. Um, you Samaritans worship, but you don't really know what you're doing. Um, Salvation is from the Jews. The Jews are worshiping properly. They're in the proper spot. They've got the temple. They're worshiping according to Revelation. Uh, they know what they're doing in worship. You Samaritans, you don't really know who you worship. You don't really know what's going on here when you are worshiping. The Samaritans, as I've said, they were essentially worshiping in their own self-chosen, self-appointed place. Uh, they were not worshiping in accord with the Bible. Um, which, again, required worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And because they were not worshiping in accord with, with Revelation, they were also confused about whom they were worshiping, which is why Jesus says that in verse 22, you worship what you do not know. 
Israel worshipped God because Israel worshipped according to his revelation. But the Samaritans did not worship according to revelation. Therefore, they didn't know God. They were not worshipping the true God. This is at a minimum a reminder that what you worship determines who you become. And how you worship determines what you become. The psalmist says it, says it this way in Psalm 115. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. And then this is the key verse that goes back to this idea that I was just saying. Uh, what you worship determines what you become and how you worship determines what you become. Verse 8 then from Psalm 115. Those who make them, make those idols, those who make them will be like them. Mindless, unable to feel, unable to hear, uh, uh, inanimate in a sense, lifeless. When you are worshiping the wrong God, it leads to lifelessness. Again, what you worship determines what you become. So worship must be in truth. In other words, you can't just say, well, what really matters in worship is that you're sincere. And I, I, I appreciate that intention but it's wrong-headed. We shouldn't say that. Um, what, what matters is that you're sincere, that you're authentic. You know, um, lots of religions around the world, uh, and even um, uh, pseudo-Christian-type uh, uh, religions, um, the Mormons and, or the Oneness Pentecostals, they call themselves, in a sense, Christians, they, they're worshiping in a sincere way. They're sincere about what they do, but they're not worshiping the same God of the Bible. Um, you can't just evaluate worship on how you, you feel. If you felt moved, then, oh, then it was a good worship service. No, not at all. I mean, people in every religion of the world get emotional, feel moved perhaps in their, in their service of some sort. How we worship matters, and it must be in truth. Now, that leads to us looking at what we do in worship and why we do what we do in worship. Why do we have a more traditional worship service? Uh, now we're singing, we sang, I'm not, I'm not really talking so much about the music because this, this morning we're singing uh, the, the Gettys, uh, we sang the Gettys work. Well, I thought it was Gettys, maybe it's not, but it's from 2001. We're going to sing at the end, Give Thanks, which was probably a 70s or 80s, 1970s, 1980s chorus. Something like, so we're singing some, in a sense, modern stuff. So I'm not, when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking so much about musically, but but the elements of the liturgy, and liturgy is another one of those fancy words that is talking about the order and the elements in our worship service. Why do we do what we do here? Why would I encourage you to always be looking for those sorts of things in worship? Why should you appreciate that or even prefer it over other ways of worship? And I want to give you five reasons. Number one, worship forms the heart. Worship forms the heart. In other words, worship is not just an expression of what's on our heart, but worship shapes, molds, forms our hearts. Worship is, is about both formation and expression. So we need to remember that when, we, when, we, when we're doing something uh, in, in worship. It is not just an expression of what we think about God, but it forms, it informs, it shapes how we think about God. One commentary said, worship is God himself meeting us to shape us into the kind of people who do his will. In other words, worship is not just an outpouring of our sincere feelings about him. What we do in worship informs, it shapes us into the kind of people who do his will. Our job is to Hear the Lord say, this is how to worship me, and to say, yes, sir. That's what we'll do. If that's what it means to be obedient to you and praise your, if that's, if that's the way you want to be worshipped, yes, sir. 
Absolutely. You know, you think about it. Take a, a crazy example. If, if we were to read the Bible and, and the Bible would say, just very unequivocally, uh, the way that, um, the, that people are supposed to worship me is by all wearing red shirts and standing on their head for 15 minutes. You know, your job would not be to say, I just don't get anything out of that. It's just not doing it for me. Our job is to say, yes, sir. If that's, if that's the way to worship, if that's what you say, then that's what we do is we worship you. Again, just practically, I mean, if, if we worship in a flippant manner, a casual manner, or a relaxed way, then our thinking about God will become flippant and casual and relaxed. And if we worship in a reverent or serious way, then, then our fear of the Lord will increase. Worship forms the heart. One of the things that we will try to do that I've tried to practice in churches where I've been in the past, and we try to do here, and it certainly it's been a, a part of this church in the past, but is to have Two aspects of God's character show forth in our worship, both his transcendence and his eminence, which are fancy words, the transcendence of God, talking about his bigness, his greatness, his glory, his majesty, his awesomeness, his otherworldliness, that he's so much above and beyond us. That's transcendence. And that leads to a great fear of the Lord and reverence for God, and that's good and right and proper. But we want, so we want to have that, and we want to have his eminence. We want to sense that and highlight that, which is his tenderness, his care, his intimacy with us, that he's our father, that Jesus is our elder brother and our friend. And so we want to emphasize both of those because we want to think rightly about God. We want to be on the one hand in awe of this majestic and glorious God uh, whom we worship and at the same time sense him as being our tender, loving, kind, guiding uh, father, brother. Um, So transcendence and eminence, worship forms the heart. Number two, and why we should appreciate uh, some of these more traditional elements in worship. Uh, worship is more than singing. Worship is more than singing. Uh, well, I think one of the great, uh, one of the things that saddens me about a, a lot of modern worship and newer, newer churches is that they basically only have singing. You have about 30 minutes to work yourself up into a froth, and then you have, uh, and then you have a 30-minute sermon, and that's it. You just sing and preach, and that's it. That, that's the extent of it. And, um, you know, maybe you're going to have some video announcements, testimonies in between. But, but it's mostly just singing and preaching. And the singing is called worship. And the preaching is called something else. I don't know what you call it, preaching or teaching or sharing or whatever. But it's not worship. That, the singing is, 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 is the worship. But listen, a whole, the whole service is a worship service. When we pass the offering plate, that is an act of worship. That is a part of worship. When we receive the benediction at the end of a service, that is a part of worship. That is an act of worship, and it's forming you. As you put your hands out to receive the benediction, it's it's forming you. Confessing sin, that is a part of worship. Uh, Affirming our faith together is a part of worship. The whole service is worship, not just the singing. Gordon, who we hired to to be our uh, director of music, music director, I don't know if you picked it up, he's not called the worship leader. Because he's helping and giving leadership in one area of worship. But he's not the worship leader. I'm the worship leader. Or the the elders really are the worship leader. And and leaders, they delegate it to me. And then they say, if things are not going well, we need to make some changes here and there. And I say, absolutely, that's what we'll do. But when we restrict and narrow worship to just the singing we're really hurting our understanding of who God is and what worship is. Everything we do during this hour is worship. So, again, why I appreciate this, number one, two. Number three, worship should connect us with history. You know, our spiritual fathers, our spiritual mothers, our spiritual grandparents should have a vote and have a say in how it is that we worship, how we do everything, how we think, really. Um, it's a way to honor them, and it's a way to uh, humble ourselves and not think that we know better about everything, which, of course, is the way we kind of come into the world. But, you know, so much of um, uh, worship these days is basically saying we know better now. And so we get rid of these old, stodgy elements like saying the Apostles' Creed or the Lord's Prayer or whatever. Worship should connect us with history, with those who have walked before us, uh, in the Lord. Number four, worship should go against the grain of modern society. This is just um, more probably uh, 
I don't necessarily have a verse on this one, so this would be just a, a thought that, um, that I think is helpful as we try to renew our minds according to Scripture. You know, modern society is loud and, and fast, and worship should be um, not, not so loud necessarily, but more quiet and not fast, but slow and contemplative. Um, most modern worship services sort of uh, are restricted to just one sort of style, sort of a happy, clappy um, style when there should be gladness and gravity, both transcendence and imminence. Um, you know, we have a book in the Bible called Lamentations. That means, that means there's going to, should be in worship some lamenting, some recognizing our sin, feeling sorry for our sin and feeling um, uh, a, heavy, a heaviness before the Lord. Modern society is manipulative and, and dramatic and, and, uh, and we want to we want to do all that we can to avoid that and let the Spirit convict and comfort and build. So worship really should, I think, should, just, should try to strive against what's, with the momentum and the current of modern society. And then finally, worship should include all ages. I was talking with a friend uh, just yesterday who has attended a church where in, in their church, uh, children through fifth grade never even come into the the worship service. They have their own little thing somewhere going on. Uh, and then even the, the, the middle school kids leave when the sermon, when, the, when the, the main pastor, I guess, steps into the pulpit and begins his sermon. You know, one of the best things that you can do for your kids and your grandkids is have them sitting right beside you and standing right beside you when you worship. To, ha- to hear them to ha- I mean, I love it. I think it was Abigail this morning I heard. She was, you know, just a little bit behind on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, that just, I mean, there's just, there is not much better than hearing the children pray the Lord's Prayer, say the Apostles' Creed. And for them to be sitting next to you when you confess what it is that you believe. And there they are right next to you. And they're, and, and they're, they're seeing you sing. They're hearing you say amen during the long prayer. You know, all of that. And they're... Th- there's just not much better that you can do to disciple your children than to have them there with you in that process. Not only that, you know, it's good as you get older to see. It's an encouragement uh, to our more mature members to see the faith being passed on to a younger generation. So it's, it's good all the way around. How we worship matters. It matters. It's, it's a significant thing. It's not just expression, but it's formation and uh, traditional uh, worship with time-tested elements in the liturgy, these proven elements, uh, they are to be preferred over modern contemporary thin services. And I'll just tell you two stories as I kind of close on this. Um, at um, the church I pastored in Florence, Redeemer there, um, one time a member was traveling for business, and so he was on an airplane, and he was sit- seated next to a man. They started talking, and he was from India, and so he was Hindu. And so my friend Mitch asked him, so, so, uh, so what, do you, what do you believe? You know, I'm not around many Hindus. What, what, what do you guys believe? And so he, he went off telling him about what Hindus believe. And then finally he said to Mitch, he said, so what do you believe? And he said, well, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our, our Lord, who was conceived. But, and he just started working through the Apostles' Creed. Because for years, he had been in worship, uh, reciting that, saying that regularly. And it just flowed right off, the t- off his tongue when someone asked him what, his, what he believed. Uh, Rosaria Butterfield, maybe you're familiar with her testimony. She's written the book uh, called Secret Th- Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. And in her early years, uh, she, grew, she grew up in a Catholic church and left that for many years, for several decades. But then when she was being drawn back by the Lord to himself, she kept, the only thing she could remember was the Lord's Prayer. And I think also maybe the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, that's the only thing she really remembered from her upbringing. But she kept working through them was in, your head, in her head because she had gotten it when she was little. Well, what does that mean? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be that. And she studied and analyzed it. How we worship matters. Getting these things, they're, they're, they're significant. They form us. And, I, and, and I, I never will forget, uh, it's, it's really happened in numerous occasions, but probably the most recent um, uh, situation would be um, down in my former church in Fairhope. 
uh, I went to visit a man who, uh, whose wife had joined the church, but he had not, he had not joined the church. He was, he was quite elderly. He was, um, uh, uh, his, his sight was, was basically gone, his hearing was gone, his memory was gone, um, and so uh, I would go by and see him on occasion and just, you know, say hi and, and pray with him or whatever. And, um, and one time I thought, well, we not need to do a little, little service together. And so I opened my Bible and read a verse and probably talked for about 15 seconds. So that was my sermon, a 15-second sermon or whatever. And, um, and so then I said, well, let's, let's pray together. And so we prayed the Lord Prayer. And then here was this guy who could hardly hear, could hardly see, and could hardly remember anything. As soon as I said, Our Father, he joined in. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so he, he went right along. And then we sang Amazing Grace. And I don't think he missed a single word uh, as we sang Amazing Grace. And we said the Apostles' Creed, and he knew it, you know, word for word. Here was this guy who you couldn't even have a conversation with. But then when you do this, that he had been doing his whole life, giving himself to for many, for decades. And then you bring that up and he joined in and it was worship. It was a beautiful thing. You know, I, when I'm on my deathbed and you come see me in the hospital, come and pray the Lord's Prayer with me. Say the Apostles' Creed with me. Ask me what I believe and then get, get it started if I can't say it. Um, that, that's, what, that's what I hope would happen is that we can appreciate these traditional elements that are forming us, uh, that are a reflection of God's holiness and at the same time His eminence, that are a part of generations passing down, fathers and grandfathers, the children and grandchildren, because we have a God who is to be feared and at the same time who joyfully saves goofballs like you and me. And so let us always be diligent to give Him the honor and praise that He deserves. Let us pray. Our God, we do pray that you would enable us to worship you well, to give you the honor and praise that you deserve. You are a mighty God. You are a gracious God. You are an amazing God. The grace that we have, the provision of the Lord Jesus is an amazing thought. And as we come to this meal that's before us and as we um, see the the, the, the symbolized body and blood of Christ and partake of the Lord Jesus himself. Oh, Lord, change us that we might be true worshipers, which are what you seek, who worship in spirit and in truth. Amen.